So the resource that we're using, as you know, is eyewitnessbible.org, and we're just getting short clips of each of these characters, so I encourage you to go out to that website. It's great. You can do your own Bible study series on all these people and their teaching. It's, it's really a gr- great resource. But as we jump in today with our idea of uh, Silas, I want to ask you this. What's the greatest compliment you can imagine someone giving you? What's the greatest compliment you can imagine someone giving you? We'll get to that, get around to that, I think, in a little bit, because Silas is going to tell us what he thinks about it uh, in his life. And so um, most of you know, uh, the last number of weeks, we uh, have been traveling around the Mediterranean. Obviously, the church was born in Jerusalem um, with the resurrection of Jesus. And then some weeks later, the uh, at Pentecost, when Peter preached and 3,000 people uh, were converted by the Holy Spirit and baptized Uh, And then from then on, Jesus' words in Acts and also in Matthew um, to go and make disciples and to take the gospel to Judea, Samaria, to the end of the uh, of the world. Uh, We're seeing that beginning to happen uh, with the different people, beginning with the disciples, the 12, of uh, of course, 11, then one Matthias replaced uh, Judas with the 12, and then uh, 3,000 people were converted on Pentecost Day, so the, the church is that big, uh, but then it's just exploding, and it's exploding out into a culture that is different than what God was understood to be like within Jewish culture. The Jews, uh, the Israelites, lived within their own culture, and it was, it, it was, it was against the rules to interact with pagans or the Gentiles. If you were a leader, and and some of these were God's intentional boundaries that he set, but some of them became religious practices that probably uh, went too far, and they were selfish. But they lived within their own little world, uh, and now this world is being turned upside down when the gospel is now going to the Gentiles, going to those who were unclean, going to the heathen, if you will. And we've seen in these years uh, traveling, Paul's first journey, his second journey, his third journey. Paul goes to Rome twice the last time uh, he's killed there. Uh, Through all of this, the church is exploding. Uh, If you'll remember, and I mentioned it earlier, Philippi, Lydia, uh, that story out of Acts, she was the first believer in Europe, okay? And then even last week, the gospel is now in Rome, there's, ch- there's a church in Rome, and we read about uh, the amanuensis Tertius. Well, here's another one of those. This time we're not going to hear from the writings of Paul. Lots of them have been through the Pauline letters. Uh, a lot of what we've done is what, what Luke wrote in the book of Acts. But today we're going to hear from Peter. And so uh, the way we're going to do that, we're going to uh, get... Um, Peter's scribe, who helped write this, Peter dictated it, uh, Silas, or Silvanus, was uh, the amanuensis. He traveled at beginning in Paul's second journey with Paul, but he also, being from Jerusalem, uh, worked with Peter, and he knew, knew both of them, and he worked with both of them. He's kind of a silent guy in the New Testament, but, he, but he's really everywhere. He's involved. Maybe he's not up in front, but he's a supporting character, and God really used him to take the gospel to an unbelieving world. So we're, we're going to hear it from Silas's point of view, but we're really hearing the teaching of God that he gave to us through Peter. Okay, that's where we're kind of headed today. And I want to set this up with uh, the end of this first letter that Peter wrote. Now, to get the kind of context of where we are, this was written in the mid-60s. Okay, Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans in 70 A.D. Okay, so Rome is the power of the, the entire area, and you did not cross Rome. Uh, 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 an iron hand in everything they did. 
It was nothing to them to go into an area and just kill thousands of people for the, the Republic or the, the Dominion of Rome. Okay? And so in the, in the mid-60s, Nero was the emperor of Rome. Now, Nero's quite a character. You remember reading about him. But one of the things about Nero is he wanted to build things. He liked new temples and great buildings, government buildings and parks and, and waterways and everything. Well, Rome had been built up so much, there was not many places to build something wonderful and marvelous and gigantic that he could take credit for. So he burned Rome. Anonymously, he thought. But that didn't go the way he thought it would go. The Senate and the Roman public, especially in the city of Rome, turned against him. And so he blamed the Christians. All this happened about 64, 65. And that's the culture in which Peter is writing. Christians have been persecuted by the Jewish uh, Pharisees, the religious hypocrites. You know, I mean, they, they crucified Jesus. Uh, they've been persecuted from that direction. Now it's coming from Rome, too. Okay? And so Peter is now writing to believers um, who are under very difficult times. Many, they, they know people who are being persecuted, thrown to the lions, burned at the stake. You know, all these things are happening, and he wants to encourage the church. At the end of this letter, he gives some personal comments, and here's what they are. With the help of Silas, who I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you. How does God use the Bible to, encouraging, to encourage you? Peter's saying, that's why I'm writing in this letter. Now, this letter wasn't directed at one city or one person or one... It was to be passed around all these cities in, in that middle area. It was to be passed around to all these churches. And he says, I'm writing this uh, briefly to you, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. Okay? We got that part. Then he closes. She who is in Babylon, now that might mean the, the geographical area of Babylon, but it's probably a code word for Rome. You didn't speak against Rome and live to tell about it the next day. You didn't, didn't have freedom of speech. That, that didn't exist. So, so at this time and under the, the years to come, uh, a lot of scholars think a lot of revelation is that way, that he's speaking in allegory. He's talking about Rome. She who is in Rome... Chosen together with you. So the church in Rome, chosen together with you, sends her greetings. And so does my son, Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. That's how he closes. Okay, But there's a lot between the greeting and this closing that really is applicable to our lives. So we're going to hear from um, Silas. Uh, and then we're going to take one little section of the first chapter, First Peter. We're going to make five points from there. And then Brent, Silas is going to close us again. So uh, let's hear from Silas this morning as an eyewitness. If you've ever wondered how an uneducated fisherman could write First and Second Peter in excellent Greek, you need look no further than Peter's acknowledgement of Mark and me at the end of his first letter. We were both excellent scribes, both well-educated. I, however, was also a prophet. And one more thing Peter noted, of everything, it is the highest compliment. But we'll get to that. Written by Peter, the book of First Peter is full of encouragement for Christians living in a world of opposition. He tells his audience they can be holy while living in a pagan society if they lead lives of submission and obedience. I'm 
best known for accompanying Paul on his second missionary journey. I was chosen to accompany him when he took the letter from the Jerusalem Council that made it easy for non-Jews to become Christians. Now, from that, you can learn some things about me. I was a leader in the Jerusalem church. I risked my life for the sake of Jesus and the prophet thing. But I was a close friend of Peter. I know, I know. I was best known for being a friend of Paul, but I was also Peter's friend. About the only other person who could claim that favored status was Mark, but it, he was even closer to Paul and Peter than I was. You should also know that both of these letters, 1 Peter and 2 Peter, were written in the early to mid 60s AD, more than three decades after Peter left the Sea of Galilee to become a fisher of men. The Holy Spirit's power was demonstrated powerfully in Peter in his speech, his memory, and his actions. I mean, when you read this letter, you are awed by how much Peter matured from his impetuous beginning. Peter wrote this letter to Christians who had backgrounds as Jews and Gentiles. It's a letter of general instruction, not meant to solve specific problems like many of Paul's letters were meant to do. As such, it is surely applicable for Christians of all ages who want to live like, well, Christians little Christ. Peter opens his letter with words that might be a bit mysterious today, but were surely familiar to his audience. To those who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. <laughs> wow. Concepts of predestination, foreknowledge, and sanctification just thrown in as an introduction. He then continues with words about new birth, living hope, and resurrection. This is no lightweight writing, and you don't need a prophet to point that out. So we get a little bit of an idea about Silas, and so the rest of this we're going to pull from actually 1 Peter. So if you want to follow along, I don't have all the scriptures, uh, but we are going to look at, and we're headed for, five imperatives in this first chapter of 1 Peter. Now, he began to set us up there. In the greeting of this letter, Peter is throwing out theology. In the, and in fact, uh, in the first 12 verses, he's telling them what is true. Then the part we're going to look at, he's then calling them to live it out in certain ways. Okay? So teaching them theological ideas, and then, well, how does this affect my life? That's the second half. That's what we're going to look at. But let's look at, at the very beginning. To God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Okay? To God's elect, in the first sentence, he is throwing out a theological concept of God. In God's sovereign grace, God elects some people to be saved. And that's who he's writing to. I'm writing to God's chosen elect, the churches. Okay, this is not a letter to non-believers. This is to the church. Okay, 2,000 years ago, it was passed around to those churches in this area. Now it's God's holy word, and it's for his worldwide church even still today. So we can take these words. Dictated by Peter, written down by the Emmanuelus Silas, but these are really God-authored. God spoke these words. To the elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces, who have been chosen. There he goes again. Do you realize, do you understand, do you see in, in our faith, we are God's elect and we are chosen. You are chosen chosen we think and, and, it's, a, and it's, a, it's part of the mystery of God sometimes that uh, for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life what we do is we accept the gift that is, it, it's by our choice and our uh, impetus by our initiative that we go out and we re receive the gifts that's true but somehow in the mystery of God before the world was ever created, he chose you to be his. If you were in Christ, he chose you. He knew that then. Okay, You have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ 
and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. That's the kind of that's the beginning of the, a letter of the day. Okay, we would write a letter and we would just put in there, you know, dear Wendy or dear Keegan, comma, and then we go on. This is how he starts. Hasn't God matured this guy? This is a fisherman. This is a blue collar guy. He's not Paul who grew up with the finest teachers in Judaism, in the finest schools. He went to the Harvard and Yale of his day. Peter's a fisherman, but he is a fisherman made new by the Spirit of God. This is how the Holy Spirit of God lives in him. He was the one who stood on the steps where we stood, never, several of us stood when we went to Israel and preached the gospel and 3,000 people were saved. That's the power of God in us. And we're seeing it in Peter's life. Okay, in the next few verses from really 3 to 12, he tells them certain things that are true. For example, in verse 3, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth. We don't earn our salvation. We don't attain it. We don't work hard enough to, to get to a certain point. It's not like being certified as a certified flower designer. You have to work for that. You have to pass a test for that. It's not that. We, it is given to us. It's different. And in this passage, where, by the way, in this first sentence, did you notice he put the Trinity in there? Praise be to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in his great mercy. Um, no, no, back up, sorry. It's in verse 2. The foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, being obedient to Jesus Christ. There's the Trinity. And Peter, the fisherman, the fisher of men, is teaching this. That's what this first 12 verses is about. He's teaching us these things, the Trinity. He's teaching us, revealing by God's power that God has given us new birth. Scoot on down to verse 5. Uh, who through faith are shielded by God's power. God's power protects us. He's teaching. That's what all of these are. Verse 9. Uh, you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your soul. He's doing all this teaching. Okay? So that would be a, just a good study. What I did, and I don't know if you can see it from here, uh, just in those uh, seven verses... I highlighted in pink what God did. And you can do that in your study. What, is, what did God do? What did these people do? And how does it affect me? That's an easy way to do a study. Okay? He gave us new birth. Uh, he, we are shielded through his power. We're receiving, through the end result of our faith, we're receiving the salvation of our soul. God's at work. Okay. So that sets us up for the first word in verse 13. That's really where we're headed for our five imperatives. The first word in your Bible on verse 13 is what? Who has a, who's looking at their Bible? Therefore, therefore, therefore. No matter what version you have, it probably says therefore. Now, what's therefore, therefore? <laughs> to refer back. Because of all this that he said in the first 12 verses... Therefore, now we're going to apply it to our life. Because God's shielding you. He's called you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He empowers you. He says, because of all that, now do this. Okay? We're not doing to get our salvation. Our salvation has been given to us, which motivates us to want to do things. Okay? Now the world sees it differently. Islam sees it differently. Buddhism is different. All other world religions are different. You have to be holy enough. You have to make yourself holy enough. You have to go to pray five times a day facing the right direction. You have to make a trip. You have to be reincarnated at a higher level until you make it. All other world religions are based on our efforts to get to God. Christianity is unique. It is God's effort to get to us. And he came down here, 
became one of us, born as a baby in Bethlehem, raised as a child and a young man at age 30, switched occupations and became a, a, a Messiah, died on the cross, was buried and resurrected to prove everything he said. He stayed for a while. He left. He said, I'm leaving, but I'm going to send you a counselor. The Holy Spirit comes. The church is born on Pentecost, 3,000 people, and then this all starts that we're in. We're still in the middle of the drama. We're in 2,000 years later. It's still happening. Therefore, because of all this, now let's look at five. Okay, let's talk about an imperative. What is an imperative if you were going to give a definition? You have, to do. have to do, okay? So I'm, you need to clean up your room before we leave to go. This has to be done today, okay? That's an imperative, not a suggestion. It's not something that a parent is hopeful. Well, they are maybe hopeful. It's not just something you hope for. It is do it. So imperative is, uh, it's two forms of the same word. It can be an adjective. It is imperative that you, that's an imperative statement, okay? Can be describing it, or it can be a noun. We're looking at it nouns. Something you have to do. You're expected to do. It's not negotiable, okay? So where we are. Here we go. Therefore, verse 13. The first one appears in this verse. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed in his coming. There's a certain grace, unmerited favor, that we have when we as chosen and elect, when we receive the gift of God by faith and are saved. We're saved by grace through faith. Okay? There's a certain grace that we have. There's also kind of a universal grace that everyone in the world gets from God uh, that's not that specific grace of salvation. That universal grace is that it rains on the just and the unjust alike. That even the, the worst rebellious sinners, God continues to let their heart beat and they take another breath. That is by God's grace that that happens. So there's that kind of grace. There's a specific grace that uh, is the, how salvation is imparted to us. But Peter's revealing here in this imperative, there is a grace that's coming when we see Jesus face to face. There's a fullness of it, or there's a, there's a completeness, or there's a, an expression of it that we just can't fathom yet. And he's telling us, imperative number one, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you. More of God's grace is coming to those who love him and are seeking him. Not just the universal grace that everybody gets. Not even the specific grace that you might could tell a, a testimony, tell a story of a God gave you his grace the day you, he saved you. There is a, a grace that is coming that is so full. He says, imperative number one, set your hope on that. Not this world, not your retirement account, not another degree, not a new job or a new home or a new community, not a new relationship. You know, this didn't work out with this girl, so maybe I'll try it with this girl. Don't put your hope, though. I mean, a lot of those things are great. They're good things. You know, work hard. Save money. There's a difference between saving and hoarding, but save money. That's a, being a good steward. But we don't set our hope there. Those are good things, but they're not God things. Imperative number one. Where, and, and think of it this way. Think of it like an item, a vase. A very expensive vase. This is, this is my hope. Where am I going to set it? I want to set it somewhere where it doesn't get stolen, where it doesn't fall off and break. Where are you setting your hope? Is it in men? Is it in other people, in your friends? Is it in how many likes or retweets you get? It's, is it in an image that you're trying to create? He says, set your hope on this grace that's coming. An amazing grace that we can't fathom when Jesus comes. Number one, set your 
hope on the grace that will be revealed at Jesus' coming. Number two, next verse. As obedient children. Okay, see what he's doing here? He's teaching, and then a comma. So he's teaching something, and then he's getting, he's still weaving truth in here. As obedient children. Are you, are, would you consider yourself a child of God? Are you an obedient child? Now, some of us are thinking about our own kids. They, went, they probably all went through phases where obedience was like, nah, not, a, not much going on there. I get it. That's why I, when I sing this, the song that Julie picked, the goodness of God, you've been faithful to me all my life. There were times I was so disobedient to everybody in my life and to the God who made me. And it, there's nothing but goodness that he's given me. So he sets up this next truth. And he says, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Do not conform to evil desires in your old life before Christ. Think about the word conform, okay? If you're in the manufacturing industry, think about uh, metalwork, uh, a mold or plastic or uh, styrofoam molding or things like that. You're going to have a mold a cast or a mold that you're going to pour liquid metal in it or you're going to pour plastic or styrofoam beads in it or whatever, and it conforms to whatever that mold is shaped. That's what he's saying. Even a child could understand this. We play with Play-Doh, don't we? That's what Play-Doh is. You, you squeeze it through that thing or you press it down in the third, and it's going to take the form, the shape, of whatever you're pressing it into. And he's saying... Don't conform. Don't be pressed into your evil desires. That's not you. That's your old life. Don't conform to your old way of thinking, your old ideas that tend to affirm who you are. Or you, you think they affirm your value. No, those are your old evil desires. And he says, imperative number two, don't be conformed to your old evil desires before you knew Christ. In the culture in which he's writing, think about Rome and Greece and their values and their cultures. Just how, I mean, it was nothing. If, if a man had a wife, he also had mistresses, okay? And if he had a family and he already had two daughters, he wanted sons, and the next one comes along. It was, it was not unusual. It was common practice. When that baby was born, if it was a girl, and we didn't want another girl, and the man decided, I don't want her, they would put her out in the ditch on the curb. Think about coming into this society with the truth of God. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. That was a radical idea. And now he's saying it here. Don't conform to those old ways about marriage, about money, about who you are as a man, about government, about religious uh, honesty and teaching. Don't conform. This is new. God is doing a new thing. His name is Jesus. Don't conform. Number three, next verse. But just as he who has is, who is called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Now, didn't realize this until this week, but Peter, in writing this letter, 1 Peter, quotes over and over and over and over again the Old Testament. Peter, yes, is a fisherman, but Peter knows the Old Testament. He knows his faith. In fact, this, that one came from Leviticus 19. Be holy as I am holy. But he, he, in this book, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 times, he quotes 
Old Testament. If you have a study Bible, it's going to be in parentheses or it's going to be in italics or it's going to be put together in a separate um, a paragraph and you're going to see a little footnote there, an A, a B, a C, a D or something like that. And if you uh, look down at the bottom on a paper Bible or if you touch that on your uh, e-Bible, it's going to give you that verse. This comes from Leviticus, but he also quotes Isaiah, Psalms, Exodus, and Proverbs. Peter's building a case, and he says, set your hope on the grace to be revealed when Jesus comes. Don't conform to your old evil desires, and be holy. Now, the Leviticus says, be holy, because it's God speaking. Be holy as I am holy. He puts it in our real life. Be holy in all you do. When you're saved, God makes you holy. Justification. It happens in an instant. It is a free gift of God. You're forever, completely, in his view, made pure, righteous, and holy. Justification. In a second. In a millisecond. In a nanosecond. When you trust Christ, that's what happens. But our behavior tends to follow. It's supposed to follow that our behavior becomes holy, Christ-like. Holy means set apart, consecrated, separate, pure. So he's not just quoting God from Leviticus, be holy as I am holy. He's saying, be holy in all you do. Now, is there anybody in the room that uses that as a filter or a judge for your everyday decisions about jobs you take or don't take or working with customers or uh, people in your family. Um, is this the holy thing to do? Has anybody ever asked themselves that? No, I've never, has, I've never asked myself that. Let's rephrase it. Go back to the 80s and 90s. What would Jesus do? Same thing. Jesus was holy. What would Jesus do? How many people in the room have ever asked themselves that? We do that sometimes. I encourage you to do that. Be holy in all you do. Well, I gotta have a, I gotta have a way to figure that out. Ask yourself, to, would Jesus do this? Is this a holy thing to say? He says, set your hope on the grace that's coming. Do not conform to your evil desires. Be holy in all that you do. Number four, next verse. But just, uh, excuse me, since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, there he goes again, he's teaching before he's calling you to do something. Since you call on a father who judges everybody's work impartially, okay? So that means fairly, okay? So your kid has a 4-H club calf. Right? And you, you've been working and grooming and get them ready. And now it's time to go to the fair. And you go to the fair. There's a the judge. And sometimes that happens and it all comes down. And we think, that's, that's, the, that's the grand champion? Are you kidding me? You know? No, God's judgment is not like that. It's perfect. It's impartial. And he's saying, since... You call on a God whose judgment, who judges each person's work impartially. Because of that, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. He's teaching a lot in there. We have a certain number of days here. This is not our life. If you've ever wondered, is there more to life than this? The answer is yes. And Jesus came to make it real to us, to reveal it to us. And he's saying, since there is a God who's going to judge everybody's work, live out what time you have here as foreigners. Like, this is not my home. I'm just traveling through. It is not that big a deal. I am not going to freak out about this. This is, I'm just here for a while. And yet we tend, and I understand it. I do it too. That something happens and it's like, oh, it's, and we say it sometimes. Man, it's the end of my world. No. You've been bought with a price. This world is passing away. Jesus is coming. Set your hope on that grace, not anything here. Don't conform to that old way of thinking. 
Be holy in all you do. And live out your time here fearing God. Now, it's not a, it's not a Howl of 13 or a slasher movie fear. It's not that kind of fear. Reverence, awe. He loves you, but yet we fear him because he is God and we are not. Okay? So, live out your time here in reverent fear as foreigners. This is not my home. I'm just passing through. Not putting all my eggs in this basket. I've got a home in heaven. I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. Do we think that in our world? We should. And then the last one. He goes down and does some more teaching, but scroll down to verse 22. Now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other. There he goes again. He's telling us stuff before he calls us to do something. Now that you have, been pure, you have purified yourself by obeying the truth. How do you live a pure life? How do you make yourself pure and holy? Obey the truth. Trust and obey. So that you have a sincere love for each other. Here it is. Love one another deeply. From a pure heart. God, speaking to Peter, who was dictating to Silas, who wrote it down, who 200 years later, God put it in the canon, the collection of books that make the Holy Bible, and 2,000 years later, we get it. God says, love one another deeply from your heart. Now, there are no extemporaneous words. He did not stop with love one another. He said love one another deeply. But he didn't stop there. Love one another deeply from your heart. There's something in that. And he's saying this is an imperative. Love one another. Deeply. All these things God's calling us to do. He's building the case with the theology of truth. Therefore, he goes into all of these. And the rest of the book, there's more of it. And it's good. It is good. You get to the last chapter, then last few verses. Then we see that Silas is the Emmanuelus, and he's been writing it all down. Let's hear from Silas as he closes this part. And then we'll close together, and then we've got a couple things to do at the end, and we'll be out the door. Peter approaches the end of his letter by talking about how people should live as the end of all things comes near. They should be calm, self-controlled, and prayerful, not fearful, freaking out and shrieking at the top of their lungs at the things of this world, things like politics and economies. Above all else, they should have real, deep love for each other. So often, people think they already know what this means, when actually they don't. Be good and faithful through persecution and not give in to worldly ways. I mean, stop and think, what are worldly ways and responses? Peter ends his first letter with instructions for good behavior within the church. Leaders should look after the well-being of their flocks so they can win approval of Jesus, the chief shepherd. Younger members should submit to the elders. Everyone should have an attitude of service and submission. I mean, would you look at that? Still applies today. <laughs> now, reminding his readers of the spiritual war that rages, all Christians should be self-controlled and vigilant so they can resist the devil. Now, the devil is like a roaring lion searching for his prey. Those that resist and remain faithful will receive all grace and share eternal life with God. Now, Peter finishes his letter by including greetings from his spiritual son Mark and from the church in Babylon. Which Babylon? Maybe the true Babylon, maybe Rome, maybe an evil city like Babylon, maybe all of the above, who knows? Oh. And he tells his readers that he is sending the letter by Silvanus. That's me, Silas. Silvanus, Silas, potato, potato. Oh, he compliments me by calling me 
a faithful brother. And if you know Peter, there is no higher compliment. A faithful brother. What is the highest compliment you can imagine someone ever giving you? In this world, it might be like Silas describes. Somebody loving you in a way, deeply, from the heart. That they consider you blood. You're my brother. No matter what happens. Like in a family. No matter what happens in that family, it can go haywire. It can spin out of control. And we've seen it happen. You've experienced it. But it doesn't change the reality of the blood. If you're in Christ and his blood has cleansed you and made you his own, then we are brothers and sisters. But I think Silas in this story is wrong in one respect. There's one greater compliment. Because someday the Bible says we will all see Jesus face to face. And for those who are faithful, that's the same. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. That's the highest compliment. And that is not in this world. That is beyond all of us. Where are you setting your hope? What are, to what are you conforming? How are you living out your days? These imperatives, they apply to our lives. It's, it's one thing to understand the theology that he writes about in the first 12 verses. To have an idea and form a a theology of your own about predestination and God's foresight and the elect and God who God chooses and who God chooses not to and who God heals and who God does not heal. That's one thing, but it's another complete thing to put that theology into practice. And and in this, he's given us five at least five in the first chapter. Love one another deeply from the heart. If we do that, it's an action. Love is an action. Sometimes love is difficult. Love is discipline. Love is saying no, not always saying yes. It's hard, but it's true. What's the greatest compliment you're living for? I hope it's something more than what you're going to read on Instagram. Let's pray. Father God, we're thankful for your truth today, how you're using all things for our good and your glory. We don't understand it all, especially in the pain and the loss and the grief. Sometimes we feel like we're just going to go over the edge. But we know you love us. You poured your life out for us to redeem us. And you're calling us to to live a holy life. You won't call us to do something that you won't equip us to do. It is not in our own strength that we're going to make holy, what would Jesus do, decisions this week. Help us to listen to you. To not obey our old evil way of living. But to obey you in this new life to which you have called us. Thank you that you love us that much. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.